Greetings. The following is part of a series of lectures on black holes. We will start this series off by exploring static solutions of the Einstein field equations. To do so, we will prove Birkhoff's theorem and derive the Schwarzschild field metric. The outline of this lecture is as follows. We will first introduce some units and conventions. Then we will proceed to prove Birkhoff's theorem. Finally, we will use what we have learned from Birkhoff's theorem to derive the Schwarzschild metric. Throughout the entirety of this lecture series, we will adopt the Planck unit convention. That is, we set Newton's constant, Planck's constant, Boltzmann's constant, and the speed of light to one. Moreover, the metric signature that we will use is the minus plus 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 signature. These conventions are common in general relativity books like Hawking Analysis, Large Scale Structure of Space Time, and Meisner Thorne and Wheeler's Gravitation. In addition to this, the Einstein field equations will be written as follows, where r mu nu is the Ricci tensor, r is the Ricci scalar, t mu nu is the energy momentum tensor, and lambda is the cosmological constant. We will adopt the convention that lambda less than zero is for anti-disitter space, and lambda greater than zero is for disitter space. Now, let us introduce Birkhoff's theorem. Birkhoff's theorem states that a spherically symmetric solution to the vacuum Einstein field equation must be static and asymptotically flat. In other words, the metric must be time independent and must reduce to the Minkowski metric at largest distances from the black hole. This means that the exterior solution to the vacuum Einstein field equation must be the Schwarzschild metric. To prove this, it is easier to write the Einstein field equations in a different form. To simplify things, let us first set the cosmological constant to zero. Now, let us take the trace of the Einstein field equations. Recall that the trace of the Ricci tensor is simply the Ricci scalar, and the trace of the energy momentum tensor is simply t. Therefore, r is equal to minus 8 pi t. As a result, the Einstein field equations can be written in the following form. Since we are trying to solve for the vacuum Einstein field equations, the energy momentum tensor can be set to zero. Therefore, the Einstein field equations in a vacuum can be reduced to the following form. Now, the task at hand is to compute the Ricci tensor. This can be done in many ways. The most straightforward but the slowest way is to do it by components and, com and compute the Christoffel symbols. To speed up the calculations of the Christoffel symbols, one may opt to construct the Lagrangian and solve the Euler-Lagrange equations. The less obvious but much more efficient way of calculating the Ricci tensor is to use differential forms. This is not so straightforward because our final answer will be expressed as orthonormal bases instead of in component form. The fastest and most adaptable way to compute the Ricci tensor is to use a computer to solve for the individual components. In this lecture, we will both use the di direct computation method and the method of differential forms to calculate the components of the Ricci tensor. For those who want to calculate the Ricci tensor using a computer, we will, I strongly recommend learning an algebra handling language like Mathematica. For more details of this, please refer to Hartle's Mathematica notebooks in Hartle's Gravity and Introduction to Einstein's General Relativity. To prove Birkhoff's theorem, we first have to write a spherically symmetric metric. One may think that the most general form of a spherically symmetric metric is as follows. However, we can always perform a coordinate transformation to make the metric look nicer. For example, we can set r bar to equal square root f. Therefore, dr bar is as follows. And then we can write the metric in terms of dr bar and dt. As we can see, it looks uglier, but these functions can simply be replaced as arbitrary functions of r bar and t. As a result, the metric from the pre previous slide can be written as follows. From here, we can cancel out the dr bar dt term by making another coordinate transformation, namely the following. Doing so, we yield the following metric, and the most general form of the metric can be written as follows, where the bars have been dropped to save writing. Now, let us proceed to prove the first part of Birkhoff's theorem. That is to prove that a spherically symmetric solution to the vacuum Einstein field equation is static. For pedagogical purposes, we will calculate the RTR component using Christoffel symbols, and we will calculate the RTT component using differential forms. The rest of the other components will be listed out in subsequent slides, as the aforementioned methodologies can be used to obtain the other components of the Ricci tensor. For simplicity of notation, let a prime denote the partial derivative with respect to R, and let an over dot represent the partial derivative with respect to T. Recall that the definition of the Ricci tensor is as follows, where gamma is the Christoffel symbol. Therefore, RTR can be written as follows. Now, the task at hand is to compute the Christoffel symbols. We can use a trick to speed up this calculation. This trick is known as the Lagrangian method. 
First, let the grape accent represent the total derivative with respect to some affine parameter. Now, let the Lagrangian be written as follows. If this is hard to remember, just remember that the dt, dr, d theta, and d phi in the metric can be replaced with t grave, r grave, theta grave, and phi grave in the Lagrangian. In addition, recall that the Euler-Lagrange equation is written as follows. As an example, let us choose t as the coordinate in the Euler-Lagrange equation. Doing so, we find that the Euler-Lagrange equation reduces to the following form. Now, recall that the geodesic equation is as follows. And thus, by inspection, we can see that gamma t t t is equal to a dot over 2a, which is this component, uh, gamma t t r equals gamma t r t, is half of this component, and gamma t r r is simply this component. The computation of the other Christoffel symbols will be left as, as an exercise to the reader, but it is essentially the same. All you have to do is change the coordinate to r, and then you will get some other Christoffel symbol. Substituting the necessary Christoffel symbols into equation 2.12, we find that rtr is equal to b dot over rb equals to zero. From the equation above, we can see that the function b is independent of t and is just some function of r. As we can see, this method is quite slow, as one would have to compute all the Christoffel symbols and substitute the Christoffel symbols back into the definition of the Ricci tensor. Now, we will compute the rtt component using differential forms. To do so, we write a equals b squared and b equals w squared. The reason for this is to simply get rid of square roots in the orthonormal bases and taking the derivatives will be much easier. Thus, the orthonormal bases can be written as follows, where the hats symbolize the coordinates within, with respect to the orthonormal bases. The next step is to take the exterior derivative of the orthonormal bases, which are as follows. Now, we can use Cartan's first equation of structure to determine the spin connections. In general relativity, the torsion is zero, and thus Cartan's first equation of structure is simply as follows. By inspection of the coefficients, one finds that the spin connections are as follows. From here, we can use Cartan's second equation of structure to calculate the Riemann tensor. Since we are interested in the RTT component, we need to compute these four Riemann tensors. With the benefit of hindsight, we know that these two Riemann tensors are equal to zero. Therefore, Cartan's second equation of the structure is written as follows. Substituting the spin connections into Cartan's second equation of structure, we obtain the Ricci tensor in orthonormal bases. Since the Ricci tensor is related to the Riemann tensor in the, in the following manner, we can write the Riemann tensor in orthonormal bases. To convert the Riemann tensor in orthonormal bases to coordinate bases, uh, we can use the fact that the Riemann tensor in coordinate base in, in orthonormal bases is related to the Riemann tensor in the coordinate bases in the following manner, where E alpha beta is the connection two form. Thus, the components of the Riemann tensor is in coordinate bases are as follows. Therefore, the Ricci tensor in the coordinate bases is as follows. Rewriting the above in terms of a and b yields the following. Listing out the other components of the Ricci tensor, we yield the following five equations. Now, observe that a over b times r r r plus r t t is equal to zero. And from this, we get the following differential equation. From this, we get that a is equal to some arbitrary function divided by b. Thus, the metric can be written as follows. Recall from the previous slides that we can always make a coordinate transformation to get rid of the time dependence. This can be done by achieved, this can be achieved by letting dt tilde equals square root of g times dt. Therefore, the metric can be written as follows. And from this, the metric we can see that the that a spherically symmetric solution to the vacuum Einstein field equation is independent of time and is therefore static. To show that a spherically symmetric solution to the vacuum Einstein equation Einstein field equation is asymptotically flat. We need to solve the r theta theta component. To do so, we aim the following. We aim to get the following differential equation. Solving the above differential equation yields the following, where r is the radial component and c is simply the constant of integration. Substituting this back into the in, uh, the metric, we yield the following. This is known as the Schwarzschild metric, and as we can see, as r approaches infinity, the metric becomes Minkowski flat. 
What is more interesting, however, is that this is the simplest known example of what are known as black holes uniqueness theorems. That is, that the Schwarzschild metric is a unique solution to the vacuum Einstein field equations. The proof of such theorems is quite involved. And for more information, one might refer to Heusler's book aptly named Black Hole Uniqueness Theorems. To solve for C, we can use a boundary condition known as the weak field limit. As R becomes very large, the gravitational field should re resemble Newtonian gravity. Therefore, G naught naught is equal to minus one minus two phi, where phi is the Newtonian potential. From this, it is easy to see that C is equal to two M minus two M, where M is the mass of the spherical object. And so, the Schwarzschild metric can be written in the following form. One important one important thing to notice is that the Schwarzschild metric has two singularities, namely one at r equals 2m and another at r equals zero. In the next lecture, we will explore what these singularities mean and how to classify them. I hope you've learned something from this lecture and see you next time.